Greetings! It is I, Tantus Nair of Andrakoven, Lord and Emperor of the Chikovan Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue my discussion on Werewolf the Apocalypse in the World of Darkness. Well, where we last left off, we've been talking about spirits. We're almost done with spirits today. We were talking about the various types of them. Today I'm going to talk about spirit traits. The fact is that spirits don't have a physical body like a Garu. This means they do not have traits like a Garu. A spirit only has a unique number of traits. Well, not unique because they have the same terms slash names as those of Garou that have as traits, but they use them in their own unique ways. They have a willpower. They have a gnosis. They have a rage. They, of course, have power and charms. Let's talk about these traits that spirits have. So the first one, of course, is their willpower. What willpower is to a spirit is their ability to physically interact with things. This might be a physical interaction with another spirit, combat with them. It might be a race with another spirit. It might just be interactions with a Gara that seem in a physical manner. There are various difficulties, and this, as I said, is a straight willpower roll that they're using in order to do this. And contests between spirits will be rolled by each rolling their willpower seeing the best results. So there could be things like spirit races that they might have, just for fun. And then you would roll roll power against each other. Now the second stat, of course, is rage. This is the anger and anguish of a spirit. This is what they use to deal damage to other things, other spirits, or to Garu. Each success on a rage roll does one level of health to a Garu, or one power damage, or one power to a spirit, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, let's talk about Gnosis, because spirits have, of course, Gnosis. This is their, basically, mental and social interaction score. So if a spirit needs to do a social interaction or some kind of mental kind of task, they'll use their Gnosis in order to roll for it. Once again, similar to with the willpower, there is a chart of various difficulties for this in the book. All right. Let's talk about power. So, a spirit, unlike Garu, will rarely use its own gnosis. It doesn't want to do that. It's using a part of its own being. So what it will do instead is it will bring, kind of draw upon this battery of mystical energy that they have from connecting to the Umbra itself. Their power. Their connections to the Umbra gives them this kind of battery which they can use to fuel their special abilities. The other important part about f power is, though, when a spirit would take damage, it loses power. That so, power is both their special abilities and their health at the same time. An interesting balancing act between these two. If a spirit's power reaches zero, they don't die like a Garou would, no, or, or a living creature. They dissipate into the Umbra. They basically become one with the Umbra and disappear. When this occurs, they remain gone for a number of hours equal to 20 minus their gnosis. So whatever their gnosis is, subtract that from 20 hours and that's how long they're gone before they pop back up with one power ready to do whatever. Now during this time that they go to zero though, a Garu can do a couple of things to a spirit. For one thing, if they know the proper binding rituals, they can bind that spirit that they drop to zero power to a fetish. They can put it in there and properly bind it to that fetish. Now, the thing about this is until that spirit regains its power back to full, they cannot use this fetish. They have to wait the amount of time, which I'll talk about regaining power in a little bit. But now we've just put it in there. Another thing a Garu can do to a spirit is drain Gnosis from it. I can drain up to five Gnosis from a spirit I've dropped to zero power. Now, here's an important detail about this process that makes you want to be a little hesitant before using it. If that spirit has less than six Gnosis, you kill it by doing this. You kill it. And spirits recognize this, and spirits certainly aren't happy about this. So you can kill a spirit. You maybe just don't want to kill a spirit. Or are you going to piss off all the other spirits? 
a little food for thought. Sometimes you might need the Gnosis. Sometimes it might not be worth it. Now, charms. Charms are, well, spirit special abilities. It's what they spend their power on in order to use. And these special abilities take many different forms. There's more common ones, special ones, ones that are used for every scene. Traditionally, the common charm lasts for a scene, unless specifically stated under that charm. There's combat charms also, which will only, of course, last for a turn. Not a scene for the combat charms. Those are only for a turn, again, unless otherwise stated. So you can see each of these charms has their time periods they're going to be lasting, and they will each have their own effect that the spirits will use to, well, either be positive on your side or against you and try to kill you. Both could be done with various charms. Now let's talk about regaining power. Because spirits can regain power. A spirit that wants to regain power has to enter a state of kind of suspended animation slash sleep called slumber. Fact is, if you look at a spirit that's low on power, you can usually notice. It might be a little translucent if it's been using it a lot, if it took a lot of damage. In order to get that low power, it might look a little ragged. So they might want to find some kind of secluded spot within the Umbra away from everyone else where they can enter into this slumber and effectively recharge themselves. For every hour they are within that slumber, they regain one power. So, depending on how much power they used or how much power they have, it could take quite a while for them to fully recharge themselves. The thing about slumber is they are, to a degree, vulnerable. If a Garu should find a spirit within slumber, regardless of how much power it had remaining at the time it went into slumber, and the overall power rating it is, they can easily use that binding ritual to put it into a fetish. It can't do anything. And here's an important bout of information about spirits when they're placed into a fetish. They go into slumber. Regardless if they were in slumber, or if they were at zero power and put in there, they count as if they went into slumber when they enter into the fetish. And yes, like I said before, in order to use this fetish now that it's got that, you have to wait until the power of that spirit goes to maximum, however many hours that will take. But you don't have to wait that extra time for the spirit to reform that it might have if you drop it to zero. Or in this case, if you're managing to get it when it was slumbering, well, it just recharged the rate it was going at anyway. Some very powerful spirits can be bound into a fetish this way, basically by waiting until it's vulnerable and capturing it. A little trick. Important fact about this one here is you're using the power, not the spirit. So you're activating the fetish not the spirit. It's just going to be in slumber until the fetish itself is destroyed or it's released. When either happens, it escapes from the fetish and guess what? It leaves its slumber. It's like, oh, where have I been for the past? I don't know how long? So, spirits though can also move about the Umbra. Hey, it's something that they can do. They can fly and float about the Umbra at a rate of about 20 yards plus number of yards equal to their willpower. So if they have a willpower of, let's say, six, 26 yards per round that they can sort of float around. The thing about this sort of situation with them is that the Umbra itself doesn't always match up with our world when it comes to measurements. So I might be in a section of the Umbra where yards and feet don't translate the same way as yards and feet in our world. <clears throat> There might not be these concepts, or the concepts might be warped in a way that maybe a yard is only like this big, and a foot is like this big, and it, it, the concepts and the measurements could be completely skewed, and remember, it's a spiritual world of different rules. You can encounter something like that. It is, however, important to note that since the penumbra is effectively a shadow of our realm, it's always got the same measurements. Penumbra will have the same measurements as us. So if you are watching or hanging out with a spirit as it's floating around the penumbra, guess what? 20 yards plus its willpower. It's good to go. You just have to watch your distance analogs when it comes to traveling in the umbra. Now, last thing I want to talk about is spirits' communications, because guess what? Spirits can speak. They have their own language. But it's not a language that you would recognize, that I or you would use or recognize. Because it's less of a vocal sort of speaking language and more of a kind of telepathic communication kind of language. So it does work vastly differently. Uh, certain Garu can learn gifts which allow them to, of course, speak with spirits. 
And this allows them to communicate in the spirit's language, kind of learn it in a way and be able to communicate it. Um, spirits which are basically allied with and connected with Garu will oftentimes also be able to speak in the Garu's tongue. So that's more of a choice on their end, whether they're going to be speaking to you in spirit speak which all of them have, or the or your tongue, and be able to communicate with you. But if it's allied with at least Garu in general, you got a good chance of it actually speaking to you, actually communicating properly and not leaving you out on trying to understand what it says without the right gifts. Now, another note about spirit speech is that control-based gifts that allow you to control and manipulate spirits, you do not need to be able to speak to spirits in order to do this. The gift itself allows you to instill your orders into the spirit without proper communication channels with it, and it will understand you what you are saying, and you will be able to get some information from it without, again, you actually being able to communicate with each other properly. That's the nature of these gifts. You can use them without the gift of speech. But that's it for today. So, I went through the spirit traits. I really did go through all the traits of the spirit, everything you need to know about for understanding how a spirit will work in comparison to a Garu, and how they compare, basically, when it comes to their various attributes and statistics and things like that. Now, there is some more information related to spirits we do want to talk about, and that's where we're diving into next time. We're going to talk about fetishes a little bit more, because we've mentioned that a spirit bound to a item with a specific ritual creates a fetish, but we also want to talk about talents. And when we finish up with these two, we're going to start moving into the systems. Basically a little bit more about the actual role-playing aspects of Werewolf. But I hope you're having a great day. If you've actually had any interesting encounters with spirits in the Umbra, ones that you had to rely on dice rolls, basically comparing their traits to your own in some kind of way, let me know about it in the comments below. I love hearing about your stories from various games you've played. Regardless, though, until the next time, I bid you farewell.